Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For a moment here, I want you to think like a grapevine. And if you're a grapevine, your life is pretty simple in that you've got one thing to do. You need to reproduce and create more grapevines. And so you put your energy into producing these beautiful, plump, sweet grapes. So that the birds will come and feast on the grapes. They'll fly away, they'll do their business, and then plant the seeds all around so that the grapevines will continue and continue. That's the plan. That's the purpose. However, <laughs> when the grapevine enjoys rich, loamy soil, and the rains come down gently and it's abundance, the grapevine suddenly thinks, I'm in no hurry. <laughs> There's no urgency. And so it takes that time to stretch out with branches going in all directions, big, leafy leaves there, and some grapes. But grapes are a lot of work, and, and grapes take a lot of energy. So when the grapevine is fat, dumb, and happy, it would rather put out its energy with, with branches and leaves and that which is easy. See, wine growers think like grapevines. And they know that as, while they're fat, dumb, and happy, they don't produce great grapes. And so wine, winemakers have to, they call, stress the vine. That is, they prune back all the branches and all the leaves. They withhold irrigation so that the grapevine thinks, I'm going to die and so, with the limited resources that I have, I'm going to pour all of my energy, not in the branches and not in the leaves, I'm going to pour it into the grapes, so that the grapes will produce wonderful, luscious, sweet fruit for the birds and for the wine. The winemakers say, stressed vines make great wines. Problem is, the grapevines don't like to be stressed. I suppose nobody really likes to be stressed. But it's when we're stressed that we have to rediscover, redefine why we exist, what foundation we're built upon, and what fruit we're called to produce. And I would say the church, capital C, has been stressed now for a while. Post-COVID, has uh, the ramping up has gone a whole lot slower than anybody expected. What the, um, the larger church is telling us is that clergy burnout, dropout, is at the highest rate it's ever been that um, worship attendance is about between 35 and 50 percent of what it was pre-COVID. And youth groups, the word they're using is decimated. Decimated. Because we've, we've kind of discovered that, you know what, the youth don't come to youth group to learn about Luther's explanation to the third article of the Creed. Who knew? They come for relationships. Right there. And for two years, they've been in isolation. So they don't want to come because they don't know anybody. And forget about finding volunteers. People are kind of hunkered down. They're tired. And there's a certain amount of angst among churches. Uncertainty. What's going to happen, Pastor? What are we going to do next, Pastor? How are we going to get the numbers up, Pastor? How are we going to revise the, revitalize the youth program? 
And the problem is, it used to be when the church was in transition, we would go out there, we would find a church that's knocking it out of the park in one area or the other. We'd go there, we'd learn from them, we'd adapt it, we'd bring it into our context. Trouble is, no one's knocking it out of the park. We're all kind of sailboats going on in uncharted water, not sure where the reefs are or the sandbars. We're trying to figure it out together. And it's creating stress. Stressed vines make great wine. So we're looking not so much on the negative side, cup half empty, but wondering how is God, as the vine dresser, pruning back, stressing the church in a way that it will produce even better fruit? That's what I want to talk about today. I think that this is a time in the church that's very unique, in that this is a time in which we're going to have to rediscover, redefine the foundation upon which we're built, the purpose for why we exist, and what fruit we're called to produce. And with that, I want to get into um, Matthew chapter 7 that I just read. Now, if you've ever lived or seen pictures of the Southwest in some of these larger cities like Phoenix, they have these cement canals that kind of wind their way through the city. Now, for the most part, they're empty, except for an occasional skateboarder or some kid who wants to take a shortcut with his bike going down those cement canals. But a couple of times, when it does rain in Southern California, then those canals become engorged with water and sweep away anything in its path. It becomes torrential in a very short period of time. Now in the Middle East, they've got natural, natural cement canals. They're called wadis, dry riverbeds that have been carved out over the centuries so that when the waters do come up and the rains do come down, these dry water beds become overflowed with water. Again, sweeping away anything in its path. Now, it only happens twice a year in Israel when the rains do come. The rest of the time, these wadis are <coughs> dry. So for the, um, for the untrained eye... It looks like a perfect place to build a house because it is flat. <laughs> um, it, uh, it has sand so that you can shift it around a little bit easier. It's a whole lot harder to build on rock. Rock doesn't move very easily. And it's, unsta or it's, um, it's not level. So here's where Jesus now is talking to a group of people He's uh, been teaching them for a while. They're enjoying it. They're lapping it up. Oh, I learned so much from you, Jesus. But then Jesus gets very practical on them. <coughs> he talks about these dry riverbeds. And he says this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the stream rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall <clears throat> because it had its foundation on the rock. And everybody would have nodded their head, yep, that is true. You build your foundation on a rock over there and even though the, you know, the weather may come down and be awful, you're going to be solid. Everybody said, yep, that's right. That's right, Jesus. Preach it. And then he said the contrary. He said this, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And they all nodded their heads, say, yep, I know a guy. I know a guy who went and built on that wadi. Silly, foolish man. You know what I love about, again, the teachings of Jesus, like we talked about last week with brothers bickering over the inheritance, that this is real stuff. Where are you going to build your house? What foundation are you going to use? Things that people can readily identify with. And then I love the fact that, uh, <clears throat> that Jesus doesn't say, if by chance there should be some rain. <laughs> no, when the rains come. He doesn't say, and who knows, the streams actually might rise. No, the streams will rise. And who knows, there might even be some wind. No, the wind will blow. Count on it. Count on the rain, count on the flood, and count on the wind. And all this is going to happen to both the wise and the foolish. The difference is, the wise person has built that foundation on rock. That which is not going to move. And so as the church now has been stressed for a while, it's a really good opportunity to ask ourselves, what, what foundation are we built upon? And will it last? Because the rain will come down, and the stream will rise, and the wind will blow. And what is that foundation? Is it to support a building? No, we don't exist to maintain buildings. Is it to pay for the staff? No, no, we do not exist to provide people jobs. Is it to pay for the budget? No, no, we don't exist to balance a checkbook. It's not why we exist. But it's times of being stressed that we stop for a moment and we ask, why are we here? And what are we doing? And what fruit are we, are we called to produce? So this past week, I've been in different groups throughout, uh, throughout the week. Use that, that grapevine illustration. And I ask this question. And this will be the question that you'll talk about at lunch. This will be a great conversation starter. Um, where do you see, at Christ Lutheran, the budding of fruit? Not the branches, not the leaves. Where are you seeing the fruit? And as I've talked to some people this past week, um, one person said, oh, I saw it last Sunday. Had this, uh, must have been a third grade girl come screaming out of Sunday school with her arts and craft project met her mom there in the lower commons and was so excited to show her what she had made and recited the whole Bible story verbatim. This is the fruit, passing the faith from one generation to the next. Another person said, Oh, I know that attendance is down a bit, but worship is good. It's the most important thing we're doing. Between the, the singing and the message and the music all coming together, the Spirit is alive, and I see the fruit. I see the fruit. One person said, I see it in basketball. I said, what? That seems to be like a, a, a branch or a leaf. Not our, he says, no, I see it in basketball on uh, Wednesday nights when the middle schoolers are even skipping out of their classes to go play basketball with tall Chad Moon over there, 6'9", played basketball for Appalachian, and these middle school boys are racing out to take on the giant in the gymnasium. It's not about basketball, is it? It's all about relationships. We are longing, we are hungry for relationships. And these boys can get together 
take on the giant and play basketball. It's the fruit. Where else have you seen it? It may be a little crass, but I see it in the budget. You know, everything about the news is about pulling back. It's about conserving. It's about holding. And yet, as we look at the budget every month, the generosity of this congregation, stressed as it may be, the giving is at 99.5% of budget. This Jesus guy, he really knew what he was talking about when he said, where your heart is, your treasures are going to be also. The fruit is that there's still a commitment, even though things have changed and we're under stress and the world wants us to pull back. The commitment and generosity continues on. You know, as we, as we think about our giving towards 2023, Uh, Pledge cards or intention cards mailed out in your bulletin here. As you think about that, I would say don't, don't begin thinking in terms of an amount. Think about why. Why do we exist and what fruit are we called to produce? As you think about that gift, think about that third grader running out to the lower commons. Think about the worship, the most important thing we do. Think about, think about middle schoolers reconnecting through basketball and the commitment that we have here to the hearts and the lives of our members who love this place and understand, understand that things are changing. And yet the foundation, the foundation will remain the same. We're experiencing that stress. But if stressed vines make great wines, then what does that mean for the church? As I'm looking toward uh, 2023, I'm, um, I'm thinking about a couple of big rocks, about what that stress may look like. Number one, I think that we need to do some pruning we got a lot of things still going on at Christ Lutheran. A lot of things that people want to resurrect. Let's do this again. But a lot of those things are branches and leaves right now. I think we need to really focus on, again on all of our programs and all of our ministries and see, is this fruit or are these leaves? So as I work with the staff on 2023, I'm not so much going to be asking them, what are you going to do next year? But I'm going to be asking them, what are you not going to do? What are you not going to do? So that we can pare back and really focus on the fruit. Number two, I think we have to narrow our our path of engagement. That is... A couple weeks ago, we had another new member class, 35, 40 people. We have people looking at the bulletin about how do I get involved in the church. And when we rattle off a dozen different ways, if we give too many, people shut down and they won't do any. But if we can narrow that path, if you really want to take that next step, if you want to take off the bib and put on the apron and serve, here's two. Here's three really strong ways in which you can get engaged. An engaged church understands about the fruit it needs to produce. Then the third thing I would say is that we need to identify, lift up, and celebrate the fruit when we see it. When the third grader runs out, when the middle schooler skips out of his class to play basketball, when worship is good, when the generosity continues. We need to be able to identify it, lift it up, and celebrate the fruit. It's a time of stress. It's a time of stress. But the Bible calls you and me the vine. We're the vine. And God is the vine dresser. And the vine dresser thinks like a grapevine does, which means sometimes he prunes back. 
stresses the vine. Not, not punitively, not for discipline, but in order to produce even greater fruit. Because stressed vines make great wine. And that's what we're going to be about. Thanks be to God. Amen.